Lightlark is a young adult fantasy novel released in 2022. Written by Alex Astor, the book gained traction prior to its release as a TikTok sensation. However, upon its release, public opinion about the book hit a steep decline due to its poor prose quality, misleading marketing, and potentially exaggerated blurbs from famous authors. I had no interest in the book when it first came out, but now that some time has passed and used copies are now available for a lot cheaper, I figured I'd take a look and see what all the ruckus was about. And in this case, the ruckus was right. This might be the weakest young adult fantasy book I've read in a really long time. My name is Lindy Jung and welcome back to another book discussion. This is once again not a video about the author, not a video about the drama. I am taking a look at this book which I personally found to be a really weak example of a young adult fantasy and I want to see what lessons we can draw from this. Um, I am going to be a little bit sassy about this book because I personally did not enjoy it that much and my brand, I guess, or sense of humor just leans a little bit more cynical. So if you don't want to see a more negative video, then go on to the next one. That is totally fine. I will see you next time. That being said, I feel like it's sort of publicly accepted or generally agreed upon that this book is kind of not it. Of course, as a fantasy writer, I wanted to see it for myself, so I went ahead and read it. It didn't take very long, I think about a month all in all, maybe a little less. I kind of just expected it to be mid, like medium bad, medium good, not too memorable or exciting, but I was honestly blown away by just how unpolished this felt. But everyone and their mom has already pointed out the flaws in this book. There are so many videos about it. You can check out any of the ones by many of the amazing booktube, booktalk, etc. creators that are talking about this already. There are a lot of flaws, um, just speaking from a pro's perspective especially, I think that was the thing that stood out to me the most. But for these videos, these book discussion videos, I always like to have an angle. Like for Immortal Longings, it was the differences between young adult fantasy and adult fantasy. For Atlas Six, it was just about dark academia as a subgenre and where dark academia tends to stumble in my opinion. However, the thing about this book and the thing that I was struggling to find was a discussion like that, something very specific, something that I could latch onto, because this book is really nebulous. I mean, it's just really vague in a lot of its elements. It's not trying to do anything particularly interesting. It's hard to pin down a specific theme or weakness because it just is sort of weak all around. Also, in terms of young adult fantasy, it's about as generic and safe as you can get. Like, I haven't seen a book that felt this much like a Hunger Games ape since like 2014, but it's doing so inefficiently. Like I think there's a way to sort of rip off the Hunger Games, but make it fun, make it like for the girlies, you know, a nostalgic thing at this point. But this one just sort of wants to imitate its tropes without really understanding how to make those tropes function in a really engaging, addictive, fun, soapy young adult story. It's trying so, so hard to be something, to be a bestseller, to be the next big thing, but it doesn't understand what it's trying to be in terms of a story. In other words, this book is in serious need of an edit. So. Let's talk about how I would approach an edit to this book. This is going to be done very much in the style of Nando V movies, who I've been watching forever. Um, he does this for like films and TV and stuff, so I'm gonna try it with this book. But before we jump into that, let's, as usual, start out with some real-time reading vlog clips. Hello. So it is officially day one of reading Light Lark. I haven't actually cracked it open yet, but I just wanted to show you guys for posterity because I am already kind of dreading reading this book. I don't think I'll enjoy it. It's a young adult fantasy and those just have not been hitting for me as of late. Even the ones that I feel like are objectively high quality, I just can't get into it. And I've heard that this one is not maybe the best quality ever, but super excited to see what all the fuss is about as per usual. I haven't quite figured out what my discussion topic will be for this, like what angle I'm going to approach this book from. I have some thoughts percolating on like marketability versus story and tropes versus story so that might be the direction i go with for this one but it all sort of depends on the book itself so let's see how she pans out um i'll talk to you guys in a little bit please ignore my hair and general state of being i am about a third of the way through in light lark and one thing i wanted to point out that i won't mention that much in my like full discussion is that there is a heavy over reliance on sentence fragments and repetition guys if you are writing anything a short story a book this is something to watch out for because it creates a very distracting reading experience i'm not struggling the writing style is easy enough that it's pretty simple to get through i mean it has only been a couple days but let me just set this down and read a couple a couple passages out to you from this past chapter so this is page 134 she stopped falling barely 
A moment later, the blade gave out. By then, she had new hand placements. She was 20 feet down from the window now, but she was alive, whole. The Moon Isle castle was quiet. Every inch had been sculpted from white marble, dark blue veins weaving through it like rivers. It reminded Isla of Cleo, spotless, ageless. Something about it was unsettling. Alex Astor also does this thing where virtually every sentence and every sentence fragment will be its own paragraph. I feel like this book is actually not this long just because every paragraph is its own sentence. And it's the sort of thing, like a stylistic choice that I definitely do. I use it to emphasize a point, but this is done sort of egregiously. It is very distracting. It makes for like a choppy reading experience. Like I just want more sentence variation. And you could tell from like the spotless, ageless, each of those was one sentence. It was spotless, period, ageless, period. That also happens a lot, that like repetition of similar sounding words or synonyms or antonyms, especially as their own sentence. Yeah, I just feel like this is a tick. Every writer has their ticks, every writer has their habits, but it's something that you need to be able to pick up because otherwise it's going to be, I mean, it's just going to be distracting. That is my update for now. I think I've decided what direction I want to go in with this. I want to figure out how to make this story better. I think I'm going to do a classic like Nando V movies thing and just talk about the story changes I would make to create a more compelling narrative and to strengthen what's already there. So that's going to be how I read this moving forward. Almost like an edit letter in video form for a published book that the author will never see. Kind of like that. So that's what we're going to do. So I'll talk to you guys later. Ciao for now. It is September 11th and I'm officially probably like 10 pages or so away from the end of Light Lark. I stopped tabbing a while ago because I ran out of tabs. Still not enjoying this, but I just wanted to give you guys my last little vlog update before we go into the video because I'm trying to power through this book today before I go on my little voyage. So just wanted to give you guys an update. Basically this whole thing with the centennial, which is not really an event at all, is continuing. Isla and the King Oro have been looking for Lightlark's heart, which gives it power sort of really unsuccessfully, but they just found it and then all is well, but one after another within the span of a chapter, Oro and Grimm, her love interest who is barely in this book for some reason, and then Celeste, her best friend, like all betray her individually one after another. Grimm's wasn't really a betrayal, it was more of a confession. It was a weird one though, basically they knew each other before, which interestingly, I was already thinking about how I would like sort of revise this book, or you know, hypothetically revise it, and one of my thoughts was making it so that Grimm and Isla have a pre-existing relationship because he's so not present in the story and doesn't do or contribute anything, and they are barely around each other, so it it doesn't make sense that they're obsessed with each other like this so you know what me and alex astor on the same on the same wavelength but we are not on the same wavelength in terms of celeste who as it turns out is not celeste she's a completely different person her deal so original flavor celeste's deal is that she's a starling and they're curse is that they all die before the age of 25. That's like a really bad curse. Their whole population is under 25. Yeah, that's, it's a hard deal. But this girl that she actually is, who has been pretending to be or impersonating Celeste, it's unclear. She's revealed herself to be Aurora, who is one of the, the like older starling ruler. She's centuries old, so like 500. So 25 year curse didn't apply to her. And she's evil and she cast the curses because Oro's brother Egan, the original like Sun King or whatever, not like Louis the 14th, but like Sun Ling King, he was set to marry her and then he decided to fall in love with another girl. So she got mad and I think she cast the curses because of that. I just feel like it's like the dumbest fucking explanation for these like, this seemingly massive thing that has happened in the world, like this huge event that has changed the entire world and hurt so many people. And she did it because she's kind of like, you know, a spurned woman. But it just feels like such a lazy writing choice. Also, we didn't know anything about her story. Like I didn't even know who Aurora was. Like that was the first time that name was mentioned. As per usual, this book is mostly just telling pretty much everything. It's going to tell you the main character's thoughts and feelings on everything that has occurred. It's going to tell you what just occurred. Like literally a sort of sex scene happened and then the beginning of the next chapter was the girl 
reflecting on that sex scene. It was just so bizarre. It just like won't let you process any information. It refuses to dramatize or show or have scenes really. Like none of these chapters really contain scenes. Yeah, so I'm, I'm mad, but I'm gonna finish it and we're going to film the rest of this video and then I'm just gonna go and forget about it because holy shit, I would not pick up the sequel to this. What sequel would there be? It's incomprehensible. If this ends on a dumb cliffhanger, which it definitely will, I'm gonna be so angry. But this will be my last update because I can't be looking like this. All right, ciao for now. I'll talk to you guys in a little bit. Now that we're all caught up, let's go ahead and summarize the story as best as we can. So this is a world in which every 100 years, the island of Lightlark appears for 100 days for an event called the Centennial. And the six rulers of the six cursed kingdoms have to convene on Lightlark and fight to the death in order to break their curses. It's Hunger Games meets Akatar, and it's a sexy Y fantasy full of intrigue and betrayal, except it's not actually that. That's what the blurb says it is, that's what every piece of marketing says this book is, that's what the author herself says in many TikToks and interviews and all that stuff, but that is not what this book is actually about. So what actually happens is this. The main character, Isla Crown, is the young ruler of the Wildling Kingdom, which is one of the six cursed kingdoms in this world. She's basically been raised in captivity by two to borderline abusive guardians who have been training her all her life for the centennial, which happens once every hundred years. During the centennial, her task is to seduce the very powerful Sunling King. There's a thing where all the nations end in Ling, and I don't really know why, but we're just gonna go with it. It's not really clear to me, and I don't know if this is just a skill issue on my part as a reader, but I was not sure why this was her task. I think it has something to do with getting close to him so they can break the curses or so that she doesn't get voted on to die but it's not really they're not like required to actually kill each other oh my god so basically there's a prophecy and it says that one of the rulers has to die for the curses to be broken but the prophecy is like all prophecies very vague they don't really know what they're doing but someone has to die and no one has in the past 500 years of centennial so i don't know what they're fucking doing but she doesn't want to die so she has to get close to the sunling king by seducing him because wildlings are supposed to be expert seductresses but isla's really sheltered and she's not so good at talking to people, so I'm unsure as to why this is her plan. All wildlings, by the way, have a connection to nature and their curse is that they have to eat human hearts to survive, but they have a second curse, which is that anyone who falls in love with them dies. But Isla is not cursed. She has to keep the fact that she has no powers a secret. So the story starts, she teleports to the Centennial. Um, first thing there, first person she meets is a man named Grimm. His god-given name is Grimm. Grimm is dark and tall and pale and handsome and and kind of rude to her. There's an instant attraction between them. He is the king of the nightlings. Yeah. I think he has power over the dark, but he can also sense her emotions and memory manipulate, and he can teleport, and he can cast curses. So he's got it all. He is a triple, a sextuple threat. On Lightlark, we also meet Celeste, who is the queen of the starlings. Don't ask me what they do. I do not know. I was not paying attention. Turns out she and Isla have been meeting in secret using Isla's star stick, which is a teleportation wand device that she found while snooping around her castle. And they have been hatching their own plan separate from Isla's plan with her guardians to seduce the Sunling King. Instead, they're going to try to find a mysterious artifact called the Bond Breaker that is maybe on Lightlark. This bond breaker is supposed to break their curses. The one thing I do remember about Starling is that everyone in their population dies at 25. That's their curse. And it has caused huge issues for the population, but it's not really explored so much. It's just sort of mentioned. The Centennial starts and it is not a bloodbath. In the beginning, each of the rulers just picks a trial for all of the rulers to participate in. And also they're not allowed to kill each other at all in the first 50 days. At a certain point, I think at the 25 day mark, they get put into Pairs. The winner of the trial preceding the pair making gets to pick the pairs and then it's Oro, the Sunling King, the main king. He picks Isla as his pair for some reason. Turns out that he wants her help looking for the Heart of Lightlark. We've got a lot of different magical items here. Isla and Oro search for the Heart of Lightlark. She's also sort of looking for the Bond Breaker on the side. She's also flirting with Grimm on the side and also the Centennial stuff is sort of happening in the background but this gets put aside because we're seeing Isla and Oro bond. He wants the Heart of Lightlark because according to the prophecy it's the key maybe to breaking everyone's curses and he wants to do that. Also a small note, at this point I got really confused about the geography because it felt like they were going to different islands but I think they might have just been staying on Lightlark and Lightlark had different sections from before the curses when everyone lived on this island so there's like a wildling section a sunling section etc etc this was not clear to me so if 
anyone has any clarification, please let me know. It really felt like they were leaving the island. Also, if this island appears every hundred years, then why does it have a population and like businesses? In the beginning, they literally go to like a chocolate shop. I just am confused about that. Throughout all of this, as they're searching for the bond breaker and the heart of Lightlark, and she's having her little flirt time with Grimm, Isla uh, draws the ire of Cleo, the moonling queen, who is just kind of a nasty bitch. She targets her and then tries to attack her a couple times. Even before the 50 days is up, she sends her people to try to kill Isla. So that's a no-no, but nothing really comes out of that. Some more stuff happens. The things that stand out to me are that Isla and Oro are really close to finding the heart and then Oro betrays her. Like literally the day after she finally confesses to him that she doesn't have wildling magic, he tells everyone that she doesn't have wildling magic and then switches their matches so that she's paired with Grimm and he's paired with Cleo and she's really pissed about it because they were getting along pretty well. Um, something happens and you find out that it was actually part of his plan all along and he just needed Cleo to get onto her land and he needed her to trust him, which is why he spilled Isla's beans to everyone, which I personally don't think makes sense, but that's just me. After that though, she just accepts that explanation and they make up and keep looking for the Heart of Lightlark and eventually they find it. Right when she's about to grab it, she gets shot. There's a thing where Oro can't go out in the sun, that's his curse, so it's like dawn and he has to like watch from a cave as she's shot and bleeds out and Grim like comes and rescues her and just leaves the heart there. She recovers, Oro gives her the heart. All this happens in like a day. And then you find out in rapid succession that Grim actually knew Isla before the centennial and erased her memories and they had a physical relationship and she was horny for him because she was remembering that relationship but she wasn't actively remembering it. Like it was an active recall. Oro betrays her somehow. Oh, Oro wants to sacrifice Grim and Isla's not okay with that. Celeste finds the bond breaker, but it's actually a bond maker and she was lying to Isla all along because she's actually a centuries old starling who wasn't affected by the curses because she cast them. From what they make it sound like, it's not that she cast them herself, she didn't actually cast the spell. She caused the curses by killing her best friend because she was engaged to Oro's brother, the Sunling King, 500 years ago. And then Oro's brother got, you know, he was like, I don't love you, I love this other girl who was Isla's ancestor. That lady was Celeste's actual best friend and she murdered her out of jealousy and that caused the curses. Celeste doesn't really care about the curses because they don't affect her and even though they very much affect her people and the strength of her country, all she wants is to use the bond maker to steal Isla's blood and gain all six powers. As I'm explaining it, it sounds even worse, but you can't imagine. Reading this was so much worse. It was so much worse than this description, which I am trying my best here, but it's truly just, just one thing after another and not in a good way. So she uses the bond maker to prick Isla. She's able to gain access to all six of the powers because Oro is in love with Isla and that means they're sharing powers now, even though Isla didn't fucking know. Grimm is also in love with Isla, so now Th that's power sharing. So through that, through those bonds, through that family tree, Celeste is able to get all six powers. Some stuff happens. Isla kills her and then takes the heart and gets all the powers of Light Lark. And then the curses are broken. Yeah. So part three, my petty complaints. <laughs> Sorry, I'm getting really heated. This, what the fuck? This made so much money. My main thing, as I mentioned before, was the quality of the prose was just not good. At parts it read like a middle grade and not a very good one. And that does make sense because the author, this is not her debut, girlies. She acts like it is, but she wrote a middle grade series before this. So the author's coming in from middle grade. Okay, I can give that a little leeway. Main things for me were really repetitive language. Certain words and sentence structures are repeated over and over again, often in the same paragraph. Another thing is I opened this book at my friend's house and it's like reading out lines to them. And my friend looked over and was like, all of the paragraphs are like this. And I was like, yes, because almost every sentence is a fragment and almost every paragraph is its own sentence. And oftentimes you will see a fragment be its own paragraph. This is a writing technique. Like you can break this grammar rule and write a sentence that's just a fragment or have a paragraph be just a sentence. But like anything, a little goes a long way. Like this should really be used as an emphasis point to really emphasize a certain line or thought or feeling. I also think there's a really poor balance of showing and telling throughout this book. Toward the end, especially a lot of stuff gets told to you after it happens. One instance that really stuck out to me was that there is an intimate moment 
between Isla and Grimm, and I could not figure out if they actually had like sex or not. Turns out he was just using his hands. Sorry, I feel weird talking about sex on camera. They didn't even actually take their clothes off, but I was so confused in the moment and it was clarified for me. The beginning of the next chapter was her reflecting on that experience. Not in like a, oh, this is how it made me feel, but this is what we did and our clothes did not come off and we didn't go all the way. It was just a constant thing where scenes, even if they happened, weren't allowed to breathe without more telling. I think this story is a little bit insecure about its world building not being very solid. So it tries to tell you a lot of stuff. It just is telling you stuff constantly and telling you what to think, what to feel, what to believe, what's happening, what people's goals are. That's also very repetitive is every couple chapters you get a reiteration of what Isla's current goals are. I don't know. It's just a very like weird thing that I've never seen in another young adult fantasy book, at least not one that I've read recently. And I feel like could have really been edited out. Basically, I think the prose just needed a couple more passes. Of course, this is something that can improve. Everyone has shoddy prose to begin with. I'm just shocked that this came out in a published book. Like the prose is a level of weak that is genuinely, like I've seen it before, you know, I've seen it in unpublished books, but for a published book, I thought we had standards, y'all. Like, wh what's going on? But if I rewrote this book line by line, it would take me a thousand years and I would go hungry from starvation because I would not make any money doing that because no one asked me to. So we're going to talk about the macro issues of this book because that's going to be the main focus of my edit moving forward. Number one, weirdly underdeveloped, hectic, shoddy world building that just didn't, it felt like um, you know when you go to Disneyland and it's like the paper facade of a building and not the actual building and you just know there's nothing under there. There is nothing underneath that paper. Like I said before, it feels like it's playing at the greats. You know, it's trying to have this big world with lots of islands, curses, rulers, but then it doesn't actually think about logical repercussions of having a world like this or having a game like this every hundred years or having people who live hundreds and hundreds of years. I just think there needs to be a lot more work done here for this to make sense. That being said, the general scope of young adult fantasy world building is usually a lot smaller than that of adult fantasy world building. So take with that what you will. Maybe some readers who aren't looking for a really dense fantasy book with lots of like political world building and, and cultural detail, etc., will be fine with that. And it's just something that I notice because I hyper fixate on world building, but that's definitely something I'm going to address personally. Every time I thought about it, even a little bit, I just was like, I'm finding so many holes in this and it's really distracting and I'm super confused. It also had like convenience world building. So lots of magical items items, etc. were introduced kind of out of nowhere. I don't think you need a magic system necessarily in a book like this, but Grimm had a new power every five fucking seconds. There were magical creatures introduced like after the midway point, and I didn't even know there were non-human creatures like anywhere on this freaking island. It was more than MacGuffins, it was just like oh, it's magic, so why not? And at that point, you're left wondering as a reader, like, why can't magic just solve everyone's problems then if it can do all this? And that's just another thing that kind of stood out to me. Another complaint I had was that the plot just did not make sense. It feels like pretty standard YA stuff, but given the flimsiness of the world and just like the lack of justification for any of it, it just didn't really make sense. They convene on this island every hundred years to try to break the prophecy, but they do that by kind of fighting, but not really. And they've established rules so as to not kill each other, which is what the prophecy demands. Mm, I don't know about that one. Another issue I dealt with while reading this was a distinct lack of tension. This is actually something that is in part due to the fact that there's so much telling and not showing in the narration. You're often told that something that's happening on the page is tense or scary or a huge betrayal, but you're not feeling those as a reader. I just think the lack of plot logic and just logic in general just made this not a super compelling read for me. Okay, and finally, there was a lack of compelling character arcs and characterization in general. Every character feels like a parody of themselves, like a stock fantasy, mean, dark king and golden king who's a little aloof but has secrets and princess who's sort of a fish out of water and then the frail queen or whatever. The character arcs are weirdly also just told to you on the page. Like you're told that Isla is sheltered and she's sort of useless and she doesn't know how to do anything. And then you're told again at the end, no, she isn't useless because she has no powers. But you don't actually see her grow between these because most of the time she's not working toward her own goal. So that is where the characterization for Isla falls really flat for me. I think otherwise she has actually a pretty compelling base, um, but I'm gonna get to that later because there's like a couple little tweaks that I want to make to her. But anyway, yeah, my main issue with Isla is that she's constantly following someone else's goals, someone else's plan, and it's not really addressed in a compelling way because she never comes up with her own goal or plan. Grimm is also just like the, the worst. I was so happy 
when, I guess, spoiler, he turned out to not be the love interest at the end. And I was cringing at their sex scene because he feels and is so much older than her. He and Oro, the Sun King, are just both centuries old. And it's so fucked up because he <laughs> just feels like an old man. Like he is old. I don't know how else to put it. Also, he's not present in the story. I don't know who who they were trying to fool with this. He's not there. He doesn't participate in the story until the very end. He just kind of like hangs around and smirks and gives Isla like magic items and hints and stuff. Like if Yoda sucked and Oro, the other love interest in this little triangle is also just okay. I liked him a lot more than Grimm, I will say that. Obviously Isla and Oro had a lot more time together so you actually get to see how they interact. It's a lot of like, yeah, tropey, stereotypical, oh, she got injured and he like, wrist his life to save her was really concerned or whatever like that kind of stuff like they don't have actual human interactions ever and they never connect on a human level but it's better than nothing and i was so starved at this point that i was like you know what i will i'll take what i can get this is fine part four what are light lark's goals first thing you want to do when you approach any edit as a critique partner as a beta reader as an editor you want to figure out what the author's goals are once you identify and recognize the story's goals you can polish the story itself toward those goals. That is the direction you want to take your edit in. That way you're not focusing so much on what your sensibilities are, your preferences are, and your biases are. As we established, this was pitched specifically as Akatar meets The Hunger Games, and it's not really either of those things. Akatar is a much more adult slash new adult leaning secondary world fantasy romance, heavy on the romance. That is the main point of those books. They also feature a fair amount of political intrigue. I haven't read those books in a while, granted, and I only really read the first two, but they did have a good sense of the world's politics, like how it's structured, how it works. And it made sense that they were kind of weird and didn't have very solid rules or like weird rules because the courts in Akatar are fey and fey have different rules from humans. The Hunger Games is a young adult dystopian. It's very high octane, it's very tense, it's got one core concept, a bunch of teenagers are thrown into an arena and all fight to the death and the last person standing wins. But the political and social elements of the world building still directly feed into the story even when the characters are technically taken out of that outside world and put into a much smaller container. There are also actual murder games in it like there's murder throughout the whole thing that is the main conflict that happens in the first Tiger games book right off the bat i think light lark needs different comps i can't personally think of what those comps are if it wanted to reflect these comp titles a little bit more i think it would lean a little bit more heavily on the romance which honestly isn't explored that much in this book and also lean a lot more heavily on the politics Personally, I don't know how we could structure the current existing story into one that more closely resembles The Hunger Games, so I think you should just cut that out entirely. I don't know, I just think it's an odd choice for a comp because it's not that at all. Okay, so the tropes that Light Lark utilizes, however ineffectively, however weirdly, love triangle, political games, and breaking a curse to save a kingdom. Some themes it tries to explore are romance, betrayal, responsibility as a ruler, and being stronger than you think you are. All of these sound like fairy tales to me. I think this would have been better pitched as like, sort of a modern take on a fairy tale almost. I think it would also be more distinctive and interesting if it leaned hard on that like fairy tale kingdom vibe. Because that also sort of retroactively justifies the fact that this doesn't make sense. Okay, let's fix it. So my disclaimer here is that I am trying to make this a stronger version of what it is, not fix it according to my personal tastes, because if I were doing that, this would be so much more murderous, so much more bloody, way more adult, and probably not even have grim in it. So I'm trying to be a little bit objective here, but my personal taste will still bleed through. Also, second disclaimer, I am literally just some YouTuber you know, take my opinion with a grain of salt, I am begging you. So Isla in this has a convoluted backstory where she is the only one without the curses and no magic because her mom and her dad fell in love and her dad was supposed to die at her mom's hands, but instead he killed her mom and then I think killed himself? I, I don't know, it's kind of dark. And because the curse was never fulfilled, Isla doesn't have a curse or powers. This is kind of dumb. This doesn't make sense. My fix here is just let's make Isla an imposter. Let's make her not royalty at all. I don't know if there are any people who don't have the curses but let's just say that like she's not cursed and she doesn't have powers because she's actually a peasant girl yes 
this is inspired by immortal longings, maybe immortal longings had a point, okay? So the real Isla died very young. That girl was supposed to go to the centennial and be a political pawn. So they had to find a replacement quick. They found a girl who kind of looks like her and gave her the opportunity of a lifetime, except it's horrible because she spent the past however many years of her life basically in captivity, being trained within an inch of her life in like combat, in etiquette, in politics, in dancing, languages. Her original self is gone. That identity is gone. That person is gone. I think this justifies her fish out of water vibe and also justifies the element of her character where she just doesn't have the powers and doesn't have the curses. There would have to be some world building tweaks that I would imagine that the common people don't have curses or maybe there's a population of people that fall outside of the realm of like wildling, nightling, etc. Because there's no reason why they wouldn't interbreed. They're all the same species. So I'm not sure why there's this sense that they don't intermingle at all. I guess if they're on separate islands, but they weren't originally. So let's just say there's a population of people sort of on the fringes of society, no curses, no magic, and Isla's one of those. She's still Isla, she's still sheltered, she's got two pretty brutal mentors who have basically given her Stockholm Syndrome, and she has a generally unhealthy relationship with authority figures. While we're on Isla, we're also going to give her a goal. In the original, text of this, the text of Lightlark. She sort of wants to break the curses, but she kind of has no idea how to go about it, which is why she's stuck following different people over and over again. But another thing that's told to us quite repeatedly is that Isla is afraid of being locked away again. She refers to herself as a caged bird. She is basically a caged bird. Like, yeah, her life sucked. There's just a disconnect between those things for me. There's also a disconnect in that she's been trained for the centennial her whole life, but that's not really her goal. Like getting close to Oro is not her goal. Neither is really finding the bond breaker. That's more Celeste's thing. And she's just sort of going along with it. So I want to give Isla her own goal right off the bat. We see that Isla is fear motivated. She is afraid to be locked up again. Her mentors were very harsh on her, probably abusive, did not have her best interests in heart, even though they were surface level kind to her. In this, I want her to want nothing more than to escape her situation. And I want her goal to be to actively find a way off of Lightlark and just run away cold turkey forever. There has to be other land outside of these islands and she's gonna find it. She knows that the centennial is her only opportunity for this because she has no idea what's going to happen after. If she isn't killed, then she's probably just going to go back to living in a cage for the rest of her life and that sucks. So tying back to this, escaping Lightlark. The other thing about the centennial and Lightlark that didn't make sense to me was that it seems like people can pretty much come and go as they please. This really reduces the sense of tension. My quick fix is that once the centennial starts, the six rulers and like the serving staff that they brought on to take care of them because they can't take care of themselves because they're royalty are locked in magic force field, ocean, whatever you want they cannot leave. The book tries to do a lot of forced proximity anyway, so I think this will really help. And I think the island should just feel smaller, like there's one castle on it and then a bunch of ruins from the previous civilization and that is pretty much it. My second world building fix, and this is a much bigger one, is that I think there needs to be an outside force compelling this whole centennial thing to happen. It's just so specific, like it appears once every hundred years for a hundred days. Yeah, that's catchy, but why would magic on its own work like that? Why is the curse that specific? And why why is it so sadistic? My super, super lazy fix is to just introduce a deity into the equation. Something cold and uncaring and weird that brings this island out of the storm every hundred years and is like, okay, all six of you motherfuckers go onto that island and do what I tell you. Maybe this deity is the being that cast the curses originally because one of the rulers pissed it off somehow, but nobody knows how that happened. So they're just sort of stuck playing the game and trying to like, I don't know, decipher this beings, weird prophecies and hints and do trials for it. There are, of course, alternatives to, oh, a god did it. And those would probably be a lot less lazy and more creative, but I'm feeling lazy in this regard. I don't want to exert more brain power than I need to. There would also be a ripple effect through the world building to introduce a god into the equation. But honestly, as it stands now, the world building is pretty sparse. So I think we're going to be fine. Also, I don't think the god should necessarily be like a character. You should feel its presence in that it's forcing these people to do this thing and they're all really scared of it because it's the one thing that's stronger than all these rulers with magic. But I don't think it should physically appear that often, like it should be more of a sensation. Now for my alterations of the plot. I'm mostly just trying to give it more direction and streamline it a little bit so that there's more of a sense of forward momentum and it's not feeling so much like just a bunch of 
clusters of scenes stuck together with like Elmer's glue. This is a very loose and not super structured overview of the things I would change personally. Every hundred years, the island of Lightlark rises from the sea for a hundred days. For those hundred days, the six rulers of the six cursed kingdoms are sequestered on the island, they are unable to leave, and they must complete a series of trials before ultimately picking one amongst them as a sacrifice to the cruel ocean god that put them there. If the god likes their sacrifice, he'll break their curses. If not, nothing happens, and they have to come back in the next century. Every centennial so far, they have chosen wrong. It's basically Survivor, so picture Jeff Props as like a 500 foot tall ocean god with like barnacles and like a scraggly beard, and we're pretty much on the same wavelength. Isla Crown is the wildling queen, and she has a secret. She does not have powers, and she's also not cursed because she is not royalty at all. She's just some peasant girl. She was trained from childhood in every field imaginable to prepare her for this centennial, and this centennial only. She's basically cannon fodder. She knows that if she shows any sign of weakness or reveals her secret, the other five rulers will instantly vote her as the sacrifice because they will see her as expendable because she's not actually royalty. So her plan is to stay alive just long enough to find a way to sneak off of Lightlark and run away. In league with her is Grim, her only friend, the Nightling King who came to her chambers like a year ago or maybe even longer. He's been covertly visiting her every now and again and they've been working on a plan to secure her freedom in exchange for Isla's help finding the magical heart of Lightlark, which is going to be the main MacGuffin in this book. Grim claims that he'll use the heart to break everyone's curses and restore everything to normal and Isla has literally no reason not to believe him. One motif that I want to point out is that he brings her little trinkets, especially sheet music and chocolates from the outside world. He is the only one who has this like teleportation space bending ability and she has never been outside. He's slick talking, he's a little sleazy in that like kind of hot way, but he drops his front with Isla which she likes and that makes her trust him more. They're definitely attracted to each other, they haven't had a physical relationship, but they're gonna have to pretend to not know each other so as not to arouse the suspicions of the others. Their plan is for Isla to get close to the Sunling King Oro through whatever means necessary. They know that Isla doesn't doesn't have the same seductress powers that most wildlings have, but they figure that her reputation would precede her and she's pretty good at lying. Oro is known to be the most powerful amongst them because of his scary fire powers. He's also supposed to know where the heart is hidden because his people, the Sunlings, were stewards of it for centuries back when everyone still lived on Lightlark, so he should know where it is. The centennial starts and Isla tries to get close to Oro like the plan, but he's pretty much untouchable. He has like 24-7 Secret Service security. He's aloof even when they do actually speak and doesn't talk much and just kind of is like not responsive to her flirting at all. And she feels kind of like a total failure. Another thing to note here, Oro is roughly the same age as her, maybe like a year or two older. Grim is like 25 or something like that. And then the other two, Cleo and Azul, are in their 30s and 40s respectively. I don't really see a justification in the story for some people being centuries old, especially Isla's two love interests. Personally, that's an ick for me. I just don't like it. So this is my personal taste bleeding through. Also because they're not really written as centuries old anyway, this is just changing one line. During the centennial's opening days, Isla unexpectedly befriends Celeste, who she's met for the first time and is almost exactly the same age as her. She's really frail and sweet and curious and hasn't been out much, just like Isla. Celeste's curse is that she will die at 25, just like every other starling, and she's got a pretty upbeat outlook about it. She's like, oh well, it is what it is, I just wish I could have done more for my people. And Isla feels so bad that she actually tells her about her and Grimm's plan to find the Heart of Lightlark and break everyone's curses. And Celeste's immediate reaction is like, oh, you should not trust that man. Also in this, I think that was kind of the case here, but the Heart of Lightlark is one use only. It's like a magical energy source, so whoever absorbs it, absorbs it, and it's gone. There's also like a lot of nebulousness surrounding the Heart's specific abilities. It's just known to be a really powerful magical source that keeps Lightlark together, and it's not really known what would happen if someone actually took that power onto themselves. At the one quarter mark, there is a ball that happens in this book. I think it's roughly around that. It's like 25 days in. Isla and Oro both get socially overwhelmed and duck into the same little room and have that like little women moment, and then Grimm interrupts. Isla's starting to think in the back of her mind, if the heart could break the curses, she feels like Aura would have done it by now. Because who wouldn't want the curses to be broken? But she also believes Grimm when he says that he's the only one to have thought that this was possible, and he's going to be the one who figures out how to use all of that magical energy to do this. Anyway, in the aftermath of Aura and Isla's little like awkward, shy flirtation, Grimm is weirdly upset, even though it was his idea for her to seduce Oro, and this is the first negative beat between them. The day after their fight, he comes back, he brings her chocolates, they dance a little because he's like, oh, I didn't get to dance with you, and they flirt a little, and they almost kiss, but something calls him away, like, you know, typical YA romance scene. And it only occurs to Isla later that there is no chocolate on the island. Also, somewhere in here, 
I told you guys, this was unstructured. Isla is actively befriending the wildlings who were brought on her little entourage to like serve as her waitstaff. In this book, there's a character named Ella who is her maid and she's a starling, but there's really no reason for her to be a starling other than she will die at 25 and that's sad. She has an old injury or something, I think, or she's a little bit sick. So Isla helps her, gets her medicine and care, etc. I think that relationship is nice and it can be retained. I think more could be done with it, but that could also happen in a later book. And my only change is that Ella would be a wildling, so they are able to connect on that level. Anyway, Isla has figured out that Grimm has a way off the island that he's not telling her about. So she goes to Celeste and is like, hey, you were right, he's kind of suspicious. What do we do? Celeste is like, yes, he is suspicious. I think you should keep looking for the heart of Lightlark, but I think that you should be the one to absorb it and not him. Isla is like, no, that wouldn't work. I can't do that. And Celeste is like, what, why? And she has to confess for like possibly the first time to someone other than Grimm that she actually does not have any magic. So she is convinced that it wouldn't work if it were her. She says that Celeste should help her and Celeste should absorb the power instead. And Celeste is really, really hesitant about this because she's kind of on the frail side as well, but eventually agrees because Isla doesn't have magic. So Isla and Celeste start doing research, going to libraries, doing like the research data legwork to try to figure out where the heart is and also start snooping around Oro's things. The next time that Isla and Grimm interact and have one of their little private moments in her chambers, she tells him to stop micromanaging her and to basically leave her alone. And she will continue to get close to Oro and figure out where the heart is for him. But until then they have to keep up the ruse and he has to stay away. I think this will help justify his lack of a presence in the story moving forward. Also, I don't like him. Go away, Grim. I'm writing you out for now. So at the halfway point, or maybe before, I got really confused with all the days and stuff too, but at a certain point in the story, Oro wins a trial and then gets to pick the pairs, the matches which again, there's not really a good justification for why people get paired up. So I'm going to give them another little trial, a little task that requires pairs. I don't know what it is. It would just be a trial that they're working toward. And Oro picks the matches and he chooses Isla, just like in the book. <laughs> Isla's really surprised, but Oro says that he knows exactly what she's up to and that she's been snooping around his stuff, but he's not actually that pissed about it because he wants to find the heart too. And that is why he is on Lightlark, but he doesn't want to claim it. He wants to, fix it up because he thinks something's wrong with it and that's why the various islands are like sort of in a state of decay like magic is going haywire because the heart of lightlark doesn't only source lightlark sources everything it sounds like i don't really know what the rules are he just wants to help everyone and he hasn't really thought about breaking the curses and isla doesn't tell him she's like okay yes um you know what i'll help you with that our goals are actually aligned the searching is pretty much the same i would take out the magical creatures because i don't think they service the story that much and they're a little bit distracting because they don't appear until they're Convenient. I do like Isla and Oro bonding. I think I would change the flavor of their relationship a little bit, especially now that they're the same age in the story. I think they're actually both really poorly socialized. They're both people who haven't been around that much. Oro because he is buried in his books most of the time. I want him to be a little nerdy. And Isla because she's been locked up. They share a love for music and art. And Isla read a lot of botanical books and remembers like harvesting stuff when she was a lot younger in the woods. So she is able to like explain plants to him and he's really interested. So the huge point of difference between them and the main trait about Oro that Isla is going to witness and be transformed by is his sense of duty and responsibility to his people and not just his people but everyone in the Six Kingdoms. Like he cares very deeply about everyone. He acts a lot older than he is on the surface because he's been ruling since he was a child but the facade falls away pretty quickly and they get along really well. But there's still a sense that he's trying to kind of keep her at arm's length and she's sort of confused as to why because they'll have like a really nice moment and then he'll be sort of distant again and like it's awkward. This is pretty much in line with their relationship development in the book. So throughout act two, the same sort of beats I think can be hit as they're searching and developing the relationship. Grimm is staying away and Celeste is sort of like supporting from the sidelines, but also getting ready to claim the heart when need be. I think she should also come along with them. Either Isla and Celeste search together or Isla, Celeste and Oro all search together. Celeste brings some of her research findings to Isla and Oro and it's like nice and helpful and they're helping each other. I think there should be some cool like Indiana Jones ruin expert exploration, I think that could carry a couple scenes or chapters and it'd be really fun. And the trials are also continuing throughout this in the background and there's increased danger and risk factor and Isla has to keep hiding her powers and Celeste is the main one helping her with this because Oro still doesn't know. They stumble upon some clues about where the heart is but each is more frustrating than the last. There's a character called Juniper who's like a bartender with a lot of information in this book. I think they should just get it from like textbooks. I don't know why there's a bar here. One of the clues that they find is that the heart is located in a place on Lightlark where the light meets the dark. I thought that was pretty cool and I liked how that played out in the book so I'm pretty much keeping that intact.
The carnival? The event called Carmel happens at the 75 day mark. This is another thing where everyone has to attend and they all dress fancy. Like why are there so many dresses in this? I don't understand. Isla and Oro still haven't found the heart but they're closing in on it. Like they've narrowed it down a lot because there's only so many places on Light Lark it can be. I don't know how this would play out exactly. Maybe Isla's getting a little bit cocky because she's starting to gain some self-confidence and she's feeling a lot stronger and she's undergone so many trials and explored so many ruins and been Indiana Jones for so many days with Oro at her side that she feels a little untouchable. So she actually starts some shit with Cleo. They fight, Isla loses very badly. <laughs> I think this should be the moment where everyone finds out she does not have powers. I don't know how she would hide it through the other trials. Maybe they're not magic based and more like intelligence or general knowledge based or etiquette based. So everyone finds out she has no magic. This is Oro's first time finding out, he's upset. But of course he still helps her and Celeste helps her too. Grimm kind of hangs back and pretends that he's not involved because everyone's watching. Isla passes out, she has a dream. She dreams of a bird and an egg and the sun rising and falling, and realizes what the line meant, that it's not a place, but a time. She wakes up a couple days later. Oro is there, sleeping at her bedside. Romantic, I know. She drags both Oro and Celeste out. She's like barely recovered, still in like her hospital nightgown or whatever they put her in. And she takes them to a ruin that they explored before, which in the book is called the Place of Mirrors. And in the book, it's like a wildling sacred spot. I think it just maybe had some significance to maybe an ancient wildling, but it's not so magical. Like in the book, only wildling magic works there, but whatever. So it's just a bunch of like mirrors in a circle, sort of making a building, sort of making a little like greenhouse. I want the egg to be found here. I like that it's an egg for the symbolism and the imagery. I think that's cool. However, I think it being in some random tree in the mountains was like kind of a cop out. They wait for sunrise, sunrise comes and the light sort of like beams off the mirrors in a very specific pattern and shows them where the egg is located. So now they have the heart and everything's good. Before they can do anything with it, Grimm appears. Celeste has betrayed them because she did not believe in herself. Sorry, Celeste. Issa's heartbroken. There's like a scuffle over the heart. Grimm makes his intentions clear. He wants to absorb it just for the power and he wants to restore Nightling to its former glory and he doesn't care about the rest of them. Oro's upset that Isla's been lying to him, but he cares about her more. Isla's like, please, you have to like absorb the heart. I can't do it. I have no magic. You have to do it before he does. Oro tries, but then he gets taken out by Grimm. As they're fighting, Isla's like, this is my moment, I guess, and takes the heart and successfully absorbs it. Throughout this, Celeste realizes that she fucked up and made the wrong choice, back the wrong horse. She tries to fight Grimm and ends up being killed, but she redeems herself and she does rock his shit. I don't know how, but she does. She rocks his shit. Maybe she saves Oro's life because Oro is not a fighter. He's a little intellectual nerd. He can't do this. So Isla gets all of the powers through the heart of Lightlark and Grimm gets chased off. Celeste dies in her arms, but Oro is wounded, but okay. They sort of like stagger back, carrying each other. They have to prepare Celeste's body to serve as the sacrifice to the god. I want the god to connect more to the ending here, but honestly, I couldn't think of a way for it to happen with the ending that we're given. But basically, Basically, on the dawn of the hundredth day, they realize that all of the curses are broken. So now Isla has all this power, the curses are broken, Light Lark is no longer going to disappear back into the ocean or the storm or whatever, and the god is quiet. But Grimm is still out there. So there's still that. So we've got sequel set up. I think the ending, I lost a little bit of footing there. Endings are not my strong suit, I'm not gonna lie. I would have needed more time with it, but again, not gonna exert the brain power. This is just a little fun exercise for me. You can see how I've tackled and adjusted different weaknesses. I saw the plot or story. I tried to make the adjustments pretty minimal. You could do a bigger edit. Let me know if you have your own ideas for this Light Lark rewrite that I have done, <laughs> or if you just have your own thoughts on the book, I'd love to hear it. Thank you so much for watching and I'll see you guys next time. Bye.